The following is a Channel 2 News special presentation reported by Channel 2 News Managing Editor Carl Fleming. All of a sudden you start seeing smoke flying out. And when the smoke starts flying out the top of the building, all of a sudden you start smelling all the different meat that was in the meat department. Hams and all that stuff cooking at one time and spices and seasonings and see with markets burning all over the community like that this big fragrance is in the air everybody's running sweating nobody has shirts on hey bird there was a flash off the roof of that thrifty right market it was the first of a chain of black uprisings that burned across urban America, and it made Watts a permanent symbol of black anger against white people. It started at 7.19 p.m. August the 11th, 1965. An angry crowd blew up when a patrolman tried to arrest a black drunk driver. Looting, arson, and shooting went on for six days. 34 people were killed, and Los Angeles was in a state of shock. I was a news magazine correspondent back then. I heard blacks yell, get whitey, and saw them drag whites from their cars and beat them. Blacks throwing Molotov cocktails burned down 200 white businesses and damaged 600 others. There were a 1,000 fire alarms in just one night. It took 1,600 lawmen and 14,000 National Guardsmen to get it stopped. Mayor Sam Yorty said the communists started it. But Police Chief William Parker said somebody threw a rock and then others joined in, quote, like monkeys in a zoo. White people of, uh, of our state uh, will recognize the frustrations of the Negro, and I think the Negro will understand the, uh, uh, the white person, and that one of these days, how long it'll be, that, uh, uh, that the broad understanding that existed before these uh, riots will return. Governor Brown named a heavy-duty commission, which said Watts was an explosion of black rage mainly caused by lousy schools, no jobs, and poor police relations. Now, 15 years after all that, after this street became known as Charcoal Alley Number 1, things are no better. Ten times as many people are out of work, the schools are worse, and people here are still bitter about the police. But the rage against white people is gone. People here are a little suspicious of whites, but nobody here is talking trouble. Good morning to you at 16 minutes after 10 o'clock. 16 after 10. Levi, the morning DJ at KJLH, a man who plays music, talks, and listens to the people of South Central LA. The mood is skepticism, um, depression, and exactly what the 80s are holding for our community. There are a few big new government outposts, but Watts hasn't changed very much. Still looks more southern than Southern California. Tired little businesses on hot streets with no air conditioning, no parking meters, no condos, no theaters, no shopping centers, and almost no white people, except for police. There are watermelon stands and peanut stands, grocery stores selling neck bones and collard greens. And freight trains, and transistor radios. And so many men standing around out of work that every day looks like a holiday. Some of them play dominoes, some of them shoot pool, and some play other games. Come on, darling. That's my girl. And all across the 10 by 10 miles that people call Watts, Everybody is eager to say what they think is wrong. Bobby Steeler, Roberta Trapp, Weintraub are keeping a segregated, separated school system. And they're not going to educate these black kids like they educate those white kids out in the valley. The best teachers are going out there, and don't you forget it. All you them goddamn like refugees coming over here, what? they get help. They ain't got to wait no fetter day. They feed them, and I'm a citizen of the United States. Because I'm black, I'm still a citizen. I born here, and I ain't eating. Watts is a mixture of neat bungalows and run-down shacks and children by the hundreds on skates and bikes yelling, put me on TV. How much does it cost to be on TV? But more than anything else, churches and liquor stores, maybe more in South Central than the rest of the city combined. 
On Main Street, I counted 17 churches and 11 liquor stores in just one mile. And lately, thousands smoking the Sherm, a Sherman cigarette dipped in an unpredictable drug that white people call PCP. Do you think things are better now or worse? Worse. Worse? How? Because they got this thing called Sherman, and we involve drugs, okay? And drugs is in the black neighborhood. I don't like that. But no militancy on the streets, no visible signs of any civil rights action at all. The black Muslims denounced white devils and demanded a separate black nation in the 60s. Now they changed their name to the American Muslim Mission and moved into the old Elks Hall where Count Basie and Duke Ellington once played. Now they preach family unity and they no longer hate white people. Why has the rhetoric changed? Why, what's... Well, because then we were nationalistic. We had to give uh, what was called in white America the shock treatment. We had to show them the other side of themselves. And the other side of themselves, when they saw it in us, they didn't like it because it was ugly. What do you mean by that? Well, see, white America never did bring to their conscious the deeds of their ancestors, the terrible deeds of their ancestors against the Afro-American people, which is the root cause of the Afro-American people being so far behind the Caucasians today. We're trying to catch up, but we haven't been able to catch up yet. We're just like a caboose on a train. We make the same amount of, we make the same kind of progress that the whole country is making. But when the train gets to the station, we're still the caboose. We're still last. As I got to this corner and was getting ready to make my turn, to go over here to take this young lady home after work, the next thing I know is sheriff police cars all out here. They snatch me out the car right here on the corner and tell me to get my, they say, what the hell are you doing out here, nigga? Just like that. They say, don't you know you're not supposed to be on the street? And I say, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I'm taking this young lady home after work. And he, he said, who are you talking to? And he busts me right here on the shoulder blade with the butt of the rifle. And the next day, I had, a, I had a clear understanding of what was going on. White folks was against black folks, and black folks was against white. Born in Watts, Furman Moore was 16 years old, cooking hamburgers at a stand on Avalon Boulevard when he saw police cars racing by to where the violence began. Oh, I was thinking that, you know, hey, I'm a part of this. The world's coming in, and I've got to represent myself. Yeah. You know what I mean? What do you mean, represent you? I mean, i got to be here to stand for our community and for our people. Yeah. You know, and it was, a, it was a very important thing to me. Like many young men, Furman Moore went to work for a government-supported agency set up in Watts after the riots. But now, after 15 years as a community organizer, he is back on the streets, struggling to find a place for himself in the outside world. Like other reporters, I had been threatened and shot at and beat up by angry white people covering civil rights down south before Watts. But here at this corner, 85th and San Pedro, some black people tried to kill me. And Furman Moore was in the crowd that stood over there and saw it. The angry Negroes attending the rally listened to fiery speeches condemning the fatal shooting 10 days ago of 25-year-old Leonard Deadweiler by a police officer. This allegedly occurred after a high-speed race with a police car. The officer claims his pistol discharged accidentally. Mrs. Deadweiler, a passenger in the car, contends the officer killed her husband without provocation. You go down there and tell him that man is to be tried for murder in the first degree or we'll take one of them out here on these streets. The demonstrators went to a police station house, picking up supporters along the way until it numbered about 500. A crowd formed outside the store and two white newsmen approached to investigate. 38-year-old Carl Fleming, bureau chief of Newsweek magazine, was knocked to the ground by an assailant swinging a large board. Mrs. Deadweiler was on the way to the hospital to have a baby when her husband was shot. That baby, Michael, is now 14. He and his mother and a brother and sister live 40 miles from Watson La Quinte on welfare all these years. At the time Michael was born, I was, I had the feeling that 
maybe he was the cause of my husband's death, you know, and I, I've never s spoken that to him. And later on, uh, I said, well, this is something to remember him by, not only the older children, but uh, this is something that it just happened and he really wasn't the cause. I resented holding him for quite a while, but yet I loved him, but I couldn't stand the thoughts of seeing him, you know, at that time. You ever think about your father when you're sitting out here feeding the chicken? Sometimes, not. Not all the time. When I just sit and think, sit down and think. What do you think when you think about that? Just think about it. Think how it would be if just me and him sitting down here talking and feeding the chicken. Right now, it's not. Doesn't seem like like the way my mother talks about my uh, father and the way we're living now. Seems like it would be way better if he was here. What did your mother tell you about your father? You no, know, tell about all the things that happened at the house. Uh, like you know, she's by herself and she's on. She's just a mother. She has to be the mother and the father. She said stuff like if your father was here, everything would be straightened out. Your mother said sometimes you feel a little uncomfortable around white people. Because when I'm around, I don't even, I don't think about, I don't even think about it. Because the more I think about it, it just keeps me, I stay quiet too much. What do you mean? Like, if I keep thinking about it, I'll be real quiet everywhere I go. I hardly ever talk to people like and I'll just walk in the house, if company's there, I'll just keep walking, right? Because I'm still thinking about it. Now, this is a word thing, so you can take these words and put them in there. Is that what you do? Mm-hmm. Two years ago, Los Angeles High School sophomores began taking the three-part tests they'll have to pass next year to get a diploma. Students in the nine almost totally segregated high schools in South Central Los Angeles didn't do well at all. 36% failed the reading test, 57% failed the writing test, and 81% failed the math test. In contrast, at Pacific Palisades High on the white affluent west side, 3% failed the reading test, 6% failed the writing test, and 21% failed the math test. Here at Jordan High and other schools, students who flunked are practicing to try again. The problem that I see, I have never heard anybody tell me that a teacher had anything that they had to produce in order to earn their salary. I had a son that graduated from Fremont High School that cannot read and write, but he got A's and B's because I know the, his nature. He's quiet. He was not, you know, vocal and verbal. I had another son that went to Fremont that was very vocal, but could read, write, do math, and all of it, and he got D's and E's. Ted Watkins has lived in Watts for 36 years. For the last 15, he has been building his Watts Labor Community Action Committee into a nonprofit company that employs 2,500 people. He buys old homes, brings them to Watts with his own house moving company, and hundreds of young people learn trades while they fix them up. Poor families then move into the homes, and after they pay rent for 20 years, they own them. Under government contracts, Watkins Young Workers run a restaurant, a grocery store, an old age home, apartment houses, and an appliance store. But though Ted Watkins is happy being on the line in Watts, he feels his work is only a drop in the bucket, considering how bad everything else is. I feel that in 1980, the black nation is in worse shape than we have been in since the Civil War. There's more crime in our communities, crime of black on black today than there ever has been before in the history of the country. There's more dope 
flowing into our community today than there ever has been before in the history of the United States. There's more unemployment of blacks by proportion in the United States than there ever has been before. There is more broken homes today in the United States than I've ever seen before. And there are more blacks out of production today than I've ever seen before. There's an attitude today in much of white America that says, look, you burned your town down. We gave you millions of dollars to get these problems straightened out. Where's the money? What's been done? And why haven't you got it worked that, out? You know, the problem is, is that the, 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 the question that you've raised, I think if we went back to white America and asked them who controlled that money that they're talking about that South Central got, I think that's where you would find the answer. I mean, that's where because you went. blacks did not control the money that you're talking about. There's been a lot of programs. Um, basically, the programs that South Central have gotten have been tightly controlled youth programs. No programs of economic development. We find ourselves in the worst housing crisis that we've ever been in. And if you really check the records, you will find that there has been no significant single family housing units done in South Central Los Angeles in 35 years. But there have been tremendous progress made in Bunker Hill at USC and down at the harbor. You know, people talk to me, you know, about, call me from all over the country and asking me about the possibilities of a ride and the conditions in this city since 1965. The conditions in the nation for black folks are worse than they were in August of 1965. You know that and I know it. The conditions in this community are worse than they were in August of 1965. But I think that any black who, who you know, gets himself involved in talking or in getting himself involved in a riot situation is out of his mind in Los Angeles County. I think that the police have shown them from 1965 to 1980 that they are ready to do anything to keep that image of uncontrolled force. What is the image you think they want to give? I think the image that they want to give is that they're an occupying force in this community and that they're ready to blast your ass any time that they get ready. And what does that mean in terms of something? Some kind Don't of start nothing. We're ready for you. So all this time has passed and you say things are no better, they're worse. What will black people do? Uh, I don't know uh, with the kind of things that I've witnessed in my lifetime that it is not necessary, you know, if you are a liability for somebody to continue to carry it. And I think that one of the things is that we got to white America to, can't just make black people disappear. Well. That's true. But what white America done was abandon certain areas of the city and left them to blacks. So? So white America will survive whether that part of the city survives or not. In the days when it was the only thing that slaves could call theirs, the church was the center of black people's lives. 
their community center, their complaint bureau, their information pool, their recreation hall, as well as their source of comfort and hope. Now in 1980, some black churches are turning back to those days to help their people find earthly as well as heavenly hope. I should remember all the board members who are working so hard to open this food co-op. And here at the St. John's United Methodist Church, so the Reverend Lorenzo Hubbard tells his congregation that Watts is not going to die. I always say to the black people, you can't do, you can't go down. You've been down low enough. Ain't but one way you can go, and that's up. And that's where we're on our way to. We're on our way up, and we are going to achieve victory. Watch going to rise. Our city will be rebuilt. The fires of the Holy Ghost will set our souls on fire and rekindle us in the spirit of love, peace, and unity. Millions are being spent to build even more churches in Watts. But whether the churches can get people together and make Watts rise again is something that sticks in my mind from that awful summer of 1965. Dr. Martin Luther King came out here to try to calm things down. And he told black people, we need God's love. We need love. The people booed him. And a man standing next to me said, we don't need love. We need jobs. How about this anger, disappointment? And I, I'm on the county, too, but I don't want to be on the county. We need, like, we need better jobs around here. We... You know, you cannot have any money, but if you have all the other things, it, eh, it doesn't really matter. Watch going to rise. Our city will be rebuilt. The fires of the Holy Ghost will set our souls on fire and rekindle us in the spirit of love, peace, and unity.